Um, wait. So I just realized that there's a half an hour break, like for the next break. Um, and uh, so if the people that wanted to see the demo, uh, I'll do it like right in the break, like in the beginning of the break. Just come to the front and then we can uh, do that. Okay, Annette? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that'll go right. Cool, let's get started then. Uh, so yeah, hi, I'm Shai. I'm a developer evangelist at Contentful. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about your documentation uh, and what to do when nobody reads it. Um, so uh, I want to kind of take a step back and uh, talk about you know, what are the ways that uh, people engage with your docs. Uh, and throw my hypothesis down uh, because I'm also a, one of these people, uh, and that's I'm one of the people that engages with documentation not by reading it. Um, I've never sat down, uh, opened the doc file, and read it from top to bottom like a book. Uh, to give you some context uh, for Contentful, um, our 53% of our traffic uh, to our documentation is actually derived from Google. So that's not from other pages in the documentation leading to documentation. That's people outside of our app uh, searching for things and then finding it. Uh, I also have a lot of personal horror stories of trying to support people, sending them links, and, and really then coming back and saying, you know what, I, I don't want to read this. Can you just uh, explain this to me? Or is there uh, something else that I can do? Uh, so before I kind of dive into things, I want to I pause uh, and talk about uh, a reaction that, uh, that some people, I think, have hearing uh, the line that I don't want to read the documentation, uh, and that's RTFM, uh, which is a, this horrible phrase um, that stands for read the effing manual, um, and I think this is a terrible phrase. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons that are practical, but I think even more importantly, it just sucks to hear, hear someone tell you that. Uh, and I can dig into this, but, but rather than doing that, I'd rather actually quote someone. Uh, April Wenzel is the founder of Compassionate Coding. They have a phenomenal medium collection where they talk about you know, empathy for developers and the people using your documentation. Uh, and the quote uh, that she has as part of this article is, when you use RTFM, you're saying, not only am I not going to help you, but I want to make sure that you feel ashamed about your inability to help yourself. Um, oh, thank you. Um, which I think is really, really true, uh, and she, she really dives into this uh, in this article, and so I would you know, really encourage you to check it out uh, if you don't believe me. So, getting back to uh, what I was saying before, uh, you know, let's take a practical second to talk about how do we engage with documentation. Um, and I, I think we really need to take a step back from this uh, and steal some things from uh, the world of teachers uh, and talk about how do people actually <laughs> learn. Uh, and so now, uh, I, I like to think of documentation as just a tool, one of the many tools uh, that we can use to educate people when it comes to using our products uh, and using our things. So please bear with me as I simplify uh, complicated uh, teaching concepts into four GIFs. Um, so, First kind of major style of uh, oh. further. Sorry, um, yeah. you're, 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 you're too loud. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. My apologies. Um, I'm just excited to get to these gifs. Um, so traditionally, when I think of documentation, I'm thinking of the reading, writing learner. So someone that sits down uh, and starts thinking about docs from what is in front of them. Uh, they can be kind of very independently driven uh, and kind of just absorb content from words. Uh, so this is our perfect target for uh, traditional documentation. These are the people that I think really get the most value out of this. Uh, next, I would, uh, I would argue that there are visual learners. So these are people that I think take uh, most advantages of charts, GIFs, uh, video tutorials, really kind of seeing examples and things uh, being done, being able to visualize, uh, uh, visualize what's being done uh, and kind of take away the most amount of information from that followed by auditory uh, learners, so people who learn kind of by hearing things. Uh, they can also take advantage of your video tutorials. Um, you know, they can, all, they can uh, learn a lot from podcasts, they can learn a lot from, you know, recordings. Uh, I imagine if there are any auditory learners uh, who are watching this recording afterwards, they, they probably have some sort of other tab open while they're listening to these talks, which I think is totally fair and totally reasonable. Uh, and then the last one, uh, which is me, uh, which is kinesthetic learning. So these are people that learn by poking around in things and kind of experimenting. Uh, and I want to kind of uh, assert that the, uh, 
Power Rangers are kinesthetic learners because in the 25 years of this program, I don't think we've ever had an episode where the Red Ranger has sat down to read a manual on how to pilot the Megazord. Uh, if I'm wrong, please please correct me. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, those are our four styles. Uh, we have our readers, our uh, seers, our hearers, and our doers. And so let me give you some context about uh, Contentful's documentation because unfortunately I don't have uh, the insight into how anyone else is doing their documentation. Um, so I can't give you practical examples of what other people are doing. I can only do that in terms of what, what we're doing and uh, what I'm allowed to speak about uh, as well. Uh, and to do that, I need to kind of briefly explain what Contentful is. So kind of the, the 10 second pitch is that we're a content infrastructure provider or like a headless CMS. Uh, we have two sets of documentation. We have documentation for technical pe or non-technical people that go in, create content, use kind of our web app, uh, and have sorts of workflows to do things. And then we have documentation for developers that hit our APIs, uh, get JSON blobs, uh, all that content that those non-technical people have used. Uh, in my role, I only engage with developer documentation, so I can't speak to what happens in our kind of B2B motion or our business to editor motion. Um, but I can kind of give insights into developer stuff. Uh, in terms of developer uh, documentation, kind of how we break it down is into three different levels. Uh, on the top level, we have kind of uh, what is content. So this could be comparable to, uh, I guess, you know, setting up a database. You know, you have a data architecture or a data model that you're defining, uh, and that represents kind of everything else that kind of trickles down. For us, it's you have a content model or a content architecture that you're defining, uh, and that gets used by people. Uh, then kind of on the next level, you have your practitioner guides, your developer guides. So this is things like, you know, how to do the Python tutorial, how to do the quick start. Uh, and then lastly, at the bottom, we have our kind of standard reference and uh, SDK documentation. And so we have a lot of docs. Um, we're not the biggest company in the room, so I don't think we have the biggest docs in the room for sure. I think IBM and AWS and Google are definitely, you know, are a completely different world than us. But our docs are big enough that they're non-trivial to explore. Uh, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to find stuff. And so discoverability is really, really important uh, for us. And I think that comes back to uh, this idea of RTFM, right? If you go and tell someone, read the manual, what well, part of the manual? <laughs> um, so I talked a little bit about uh, kind of the documentation being big and this problem uh, around uh, reading it. Um, and Robert, I think, had this really great uh, point earlier that documentation should exist for other people's convenience. And I agree with him 100%. And I agree with what he said earlier about people being lazy. We have to make it really easy for people to sit down and to learn things. Um, and developer learning is really just developer empowerment. At the end of the day, we're trying to enable developers, regardless of where they are in their journey, uh, whether they're uh, a brand new enterprise developer, first straight out of college, uh, or you know even still in school, uh, or uh, someone that's been you know working on products for 40 years, uh, and maybe even works at your organization. All of these people need to be able to use these documents and, and use this stuff and take value out of it, uh, and it needs to fit all of these. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about content discovery. How, does pe how do people find the information that they need? Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, Google is a huge thing for Contentful. Uh, there's a joke that I think uh, is thrown around in a lot of developer communities that coding is basically 50% Google. Um, and I think that's true for me, right? Like the first time, uh, the first thing that I do when I am writing something and I get an error message is I copy paste that error message into Google and see what comes up. Uh, and so being able to optimize for uh, that behavior is hugely important and can really reduce the friction uh, for a developer when they're trying to resolve an issue or, or solve something. At the end of the day, there's an API endpoint that will do exactly what they need, or maybe they just misread the uh, you know, limitations of the, the parameters that they need to be passing. Uh, and so being able to uh, you know, have an idea of what these major errors that people are encountering uh, and optimize uh, the deliverability of the information that they need for that is hugely important. Um, and, and this stuff is, I think, actually very easy to track. So Google Analytics has a lot of functionality built into it. I'm assuming uh, everyone has some sort of analytics tool on their website and can kind of detect 
um, what people are searching for or what they're using to get into your website. Uh, sorry about the small font on this one. It's just a screenshot from our analytics portfolio, but I have a pretty solid idea of what people are trying to do uh, when they get to our website, and I can try and optimize my documentation to support that. Um, also, uh, fun tangent, uh, since we're talking about discoverability, uh, but we also get 1% of our traffic from Bing uh, as well. Uh, so that is our second highest uh, SEO provider uh, after Google. So if anyone is a Bing user or a Bing developer, we are not forgetting you. <laughs> so, um, and then we can also do a lot of stuff with search internally. Um, building search into our documentation was something that we should have done from day one. It's something that we rolled out last year in 2018. Um, so this isn't something powered by Google or Bing uh, crawling our website. This is something that we power ourselves. We can tell <coughs> our provider, these are the things that we want you to index. These are the things that we, as the people creating these guides and documentations and resources, value. This is how much history we want to give you. This is how much um, we want things to be weighted. Uh, and by, by doing that, we dropped our, our support burden immensely. Uh, we just use Algolia for it, uh, and the nice thing about Contentful is because a big portion of our documentation is actually written in Contentful. Um, by building that integration, we're also able to kind of roll that out uh, as a thing that we offer our customers now, you know, kind of out of the box Algolia uh, integration as well. So if you write your own docs uh, on your own platform, definitely you know do those integrations because you can turn them back around uh, and offer them to other people, um, which is great. Uh, and we get to work with the, the awesome evangelists at Algolia to do technical tutorials and, and technical stuff with them, which is uh, you know, kind of helping to spread the message of, of what we do and get the word out about them to our communities and us to their communities. Uh, so it's a mutual, mutual win. So going into this next section, I want to kind of focus a little bit more on those non-readers, so the visual learners and the hearing learners and the kinesthetic learners. Uh, and kind of point out that you can learn from more than just uh, reading static content. And I think the easiest uh, thing to think of is actually just clicking stuff, right? Um, I love the Google uh, API Explorer. They have huge, massive uh, documentation, and under every single endpoint, they have an execute button. You can click that execute button and start filling in uh, kind of the points. They'll let you all off into, into things right there, and they'll pre-fill you know, the authorization tokens. Uh, and it's great because it really helps drive home what's possible with your API. Uh, it really you know, helps drive home how you need to format the API uh, rather than needing to pull up Postman. Although I do love Postman, you know, I can check things right there in that, in that place uh, and really show developers you know, how they can move from this documentation into practical code. I love their tooling. Any developer documentation platform that supports this feature is just like A plus, triple awesome in my book. Um, I will admit, though, that it's really difficult to set up and it requires a lot of engineering work to get it going uh, and then to maintain it. So, you know, you are committing engineers to being uh, part of your documentation build-out process. Uh, but for me, personally, as, as one of those kinesthetic learners, this is, this is totally worth it. I also think having really easy uh, copy-pastable code um, is huge. So if you have a code snippet and it doesn't include things like the import or declaring your authorization variables. Um, developers are going to copy paste that snippet, throw it into their terminal, run it, uh, and get hit with a bunch of error messages. By, by making every single snippet kind of stand alone, uh, you really do a lot to kind of reduce the burden of uh, making people kind of figure out how the API works and, and really dig in and learn how the documentation goes. Uh, and I think it's also possible to kind of automate this. Um, you know, generate the generation of these code samples. Twilio is kind of my go-to for, for people that do a great job of this. And then lastly, uh, you can do a lot of video content. I love writing or recording video content. Um, it's a lot of fun for me. Um, a lot of people, I think, get value out of them, and we can we kind of see our YouTube traffic, uh, and we can kind of figure out what is valuable for people, what should we double down on, what should we stop doing, um, and really give people kind of quick solutions to figure things out, or longer webinars, and uh, try and you know, fit all of those different styles of uh, developers uh, with our videos. Um, that said, video is uh, both amazing and awful. Uh, it is, once it's done, you can't go in and update it, right? Like once you, once you 
hit export on that video and you've uploaded it to YouTube, that's it. If you want to fix a small correction, you've got to re redo the entire project, uh, which is much harder burden than you know making a pull request or, or erasing a sentence and rewriting it. Uh, and so that's something to keep in mind with video, but I think video is hugely impactful. Um, and I think that goes on to this greater point of you know, keeping your code, uh, or so your documentation and your code in sync. Uh, and then you shouldn't be afraid to delete your content, whether it be articles or tutorials or videos, as it gets stale. Um, you should be removing things after a certain point. Uh, I know for a fact that things that I wrote a year and a half ago when I joined Contentful do not work anymore uh, just because our product has evolved kind of past that or uh, we've come up with new solutions to solve the problems that uh, those things did a year and a half ago. And the nice thing about uh, removing things on your own documentation is you can build those redirects and, and set it up so if someone you know, uh, stumbles upon that link, maybe a Stack Overflow post, references it, you can automatically have that redirect to whatever the new or the current solution is. Um, I think it's something that we're really bad at at Contentful, but I think it's something that, that everyone needs to keep in mind is that at a certain point, you know, docs are maybe four, three, two, even one year ago just aren't relevant anymore, and uh, you're doing more harm by leaving them up than you are by taking them down. Uh, you're letting them populate in Google and Bing, uh, and uh, you want to be aware of that. So. Uh, developer learning itself can, can happen for more than just the things that we create. Uh, and I think we need to start talking a little bit about how do our developer communities engage with uh, the things that we're making. Uh, if uh, developer documentation is, is a tool that people can use to learn about how to use your product, I think they can also use each other uh, as well. So let's talk about Stack Overflow. Uh, I will be honest, I am not the best person when it comes to Stack Overflow. I use it, I consume it, but I don't do a great job of living in it and answering questions. Um, but let's be real, right? Like Developers go to Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow um, is a great pe place for people to find answers. Um, this is one of my former colleagues who I've discovered is still answering Stack Overflow questions about our product, even though he doesn't work for, me, for us anymore. Uh, and I need to send him a bottle of wine to say thank you, because you know, it is a huge resource for people, and uh, we do have to support it. Uh, and he does a really great job of linking back to our documentation. So even though this post is now going to live on Stack Overflow forever, if someone two, three years, four years from now finds it, that link will populate on our end and will provide people the most up-to-date uh, documentation that they need. And at the end of the day, Stack Overflow is going to be way better than SEO, uh, SEO than, than we are. They, they're just going to win that, that fight, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I kind of just type, it didn't take me particularly long to find a Google post where Stack Overflow beat us in the search ranking, which I think is kind of ridiculous. Um, like I said, I have mixed feelings about, about this website. I, uh, I think it's really good in some ways. I think it's really harmful in other ways. But at the end of the day, it is a thing that people use. And uh, you need to make part of your education strategy being available and answering questions there. Um, and you really want to optimize for it. You know, log the things that people are asking. Uh, don't, don't spend 24 hours a day on it. You know, figure out what questions are being answered and try and beat Stack Overflow at the SEO game. Make it so people find your stuff first before finding other people's answers. Link back to your own documentation whenever you answer a question. Uh, give the brief summary and then send people to your site uh, because it'll always, it'll always work um, and always be relevant that way. Uh, and Karen, I think this morning spent a really great, or gave a really great talk about developer portals. I think developer portals are awesome. Uh, and they really kind of help you direct where people should be going in their education process. For us, you know, we want people to dive into their documentation, uh, and then we want people to talk to us, whether it's over Slack or forums. Uh, and Slack is, I think, a really great example of a, of a good chat room. Back when I uh, did my last software engineering role before I transitioned into developer evangelism in 2014, I was at Datadog. Uh, and in 2014, we spent an enormous amount of time with IRC open. Almost every developer would just have it open in the background. And so people would pop in and ask us questions. Uh, and we'd be able to answer them and provide them really great experiences uh, and feel really kind of special because they had a chance to interact with a developer or the person who maybe wrote the technical snippet that, uh, that they were struggling with. Slack is, I think, the way that most people are doing it these days. Um, I definitely find that a lot of our, our customers and a lot of our developers that we work with prefer Slack to Google. 
Uh, and that's, uh, while that's a lot of additional burden on our developer relations team and our support team, you know, I think that's just equally as valid a way to get information. Uh, and it's really about us kind of, you know, following those people back to the right places uh, and really, you know, figuring out what, what people are asking so we can fix them and make that process uh, of using that stuff better. Uh, and ideally, you build a community where your Slack users are able to help each other. So it's not always people on your teams or you know, on your payroll that are taking the majority of the burden. Um, unfortunately, Slack has a couple of issues. Uh, I know for us, we have 2,000 people in the Contentful community Slack group, uh, which means that it is now far too expensive for us to pay for. Uh, paying for that community would just be ridiculous. Our, my CFO would never let me do that. The value just isn't there. Uh, which means that we don't get history with Slack. Um, we lose our history really, really quickly uh, just because of how, how much speed uh, there is. Uh, but there are ways, I think, to offset that, you know, automating certain things. Uh, I know there was a speaker earlier that, that kind of didn't like automation, but I think, um, you know, automating things like this can be really helpful. You know, having quick uh, onboarding guides, you know, this is how you get help. These are places that you can go to find the resources that you need. Uh, or even using things like call and response, you know, Slack, there's a feature in Slack called Slackbot where you can give it a, uh, a label or a question and just have it pop out. Um, so if someone, you know, types in something about UI extensions, which is one of our major features, you know, it automatically can pop up with a link to the documentation. So even if no one is available, that person has something uh, that they can use to kill time until someone is, a, is available to come and help them. Uh, and so this for us is just kind of a, a thing that we use in addition to our formal support. Um, only certain tiers of Contentful customers get support, and we still want to make sure that there's someone there that can respond uh, and provide help when people need it. And I think we can also do stuff with our community in person uh, as well. Um, so things like meetups, uh, you know, getting in front of people, talking to them, figuring out where they're struggling, uh, and that really helps, I think, feed back into the documentation because you can decide, okay, uh, people are struggling with this feature or this implementation. I'm going to sit down uh, and build something for it. I think Amara had a really great example uh, of game developers not understanding or not really having a good comprehension of curl, uh, and that's something that I don't think you would have been able to do without actually talking to people uh, or you know, kind of collecting and reading your emails and, and making note of that. So being able to engage with those people that are consuming your documentation is hugely important. Uh, and I think it really speaks to the fact that you need to log what people are doing when they struggle. Um, you know, if you if you know 70 people struggling with the same thing, that is a perfect place to go back to your docs or to your videos or to your content and work on fixing uh, and spend some, some time towards. Um, it's really important, I think, to log and write this stuff down. Uh, and if you can automate that logging, that's even better. Um, it's a little harder to do with uh, with these external tools or any stuff in person. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really hard to, to find uh, to find uh, certain uh, certain ways to automate that collection. But, but even just physically writing it in a notebook when you're out in the field uh, or talking to someone at a coffee shop that you know sees you in in your developer shirt and or your company logo and comes and asks a question, I think can be can be really helpful. So that's it for me. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, create content to reduce the burden. Uh, that's it for me. Those are kind of, I think, the major the major points that I wanted to cover. That uh, you know, not everyone uh, learns uh, in the same way. Not everyone prefers reading and writing as kind of their primary primary learning style. Um, uh, that your documentation can be more than just kind of the static text, and that you want to go out to your community and engage with them, figure out how they're struggling, uh, and use that to evolve and improve the the resources and the educational tools that you are making for them. Um, so that's it, unless anyone has any questions. So. Uh, what was the name of the Slack bot uh, that has the... Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's called Slackbot. It's actually a feature built into Slack. So you can go to your customization, like your admin panel, yeah. and it's, it's in there. It's Slackbot, okay. Slackbot, yeah. Cool, and then you can also build all sorts of bots oh, as well, well that, yeah. if you want. They have a really flexible API as well. I saw hands over there. You had mentioned, you know, to, to, to log the, you know, pay the cow pads when you see a ton of yeah. questions about something, make yeah. sure you note it and get it in the docs. 
Is there a threshold that you find where you say, okay, hang on, this is beyond documentation, I need to go back to product design because so many people are yeah. confused about this? So we collect that in both places. So if we if we hear that feedback, we have an internal tool that we, I believe it's called NomNom, -Nom, and that's actually something you can go out and pay for um, that, that collects product feedback like that. Uh, and our product team uh, takes a look at it as they're figuring out our roadmap for the next month and quarter. Uh, and for them, you know, it's, it's just one piece. Uh, if they're hearing a lot of struggles, uh, that they need to go rework it. They're also, you know, hearing things from from rent and new generating customers that they want new features, and so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a game uh, uh, that they play. That uh, I try to influence uh, to the best of my ability for, for the people that I see using our product. But you know, it's it's one piece for them. So, any more questions? Okay, y'all are letting me off easy. So. <laughs> Thank, thank you for the talk. Um.